Welcome back, everyone. Ready to dive into something uh, a little bit different today? Always up for a challenge. What have we got? Okay, so we're looking at Mandate for Leadership. The Conservative Promise, this 2025 policy document, it basically lays out like a conservative vision for the entire U.S. federal government. Sounds pretty comprehensive. Yeah, and maybe you're thinking, oh, a policy document, that sounds super dry. Yeah. But honestly, this one, uh, this one's actually really interesting. Like, it could be a roadmap for some major changes. Well, especially when you consider a similar volume back in 1981. I mean, at the start of the Reagan era, they actually managed to get 60% of their recommendations adopted by the administration. That's a pretty huge success rate, right? 60%. That's wild. So, like, who knows? Maybe a lot of this new stuff could actually become a reality. Plus, you got to think about who's behind it. Right, right. Like, we're talking veteran political strategists, policy experts from these huge think tanks, people who've, you know, been in the game for a long time. So real insider perspectives, not just some theoretical, you know, pie in the sky stuff. Exactly. This is like a blueprint ready to be picked up and actually used. OK, so let's get into it. What's this conservative vision all about? Well, mandate for leadership doesn't hold back. They're saying America is facing a societal decline mm. and they think the answer is to, well, use federal power, right, to kind of restore what they call constitutional accountability. Okay. With a big focus on family values, getting the economy back on track and, you know, pushing back against what they call the anti-American left. They're framing this as like a power struggle, right? Yeah. The do document talks about ruling elites, centralizing power and all of that. And they're saying a conservative president that's the key to shifting things back towards the people. It's a pretty strong message. And to get there, they're proposing some really, really big reforms, starting with, uh, I mean, a total overhaul of the federal bureaucracy, streamlining hiring, giving more power to political appointees, giving the president more direct control over agencies. It's interesting they even criticize the Trump administration in the document. Oh, really? Yeah, so you see, even a Republican president can get bogged down by the bureaucracy, you know? It's like, <laughs> resistant to change. They think Trump didn't appoint enough loyalists. <laughs> so they really want to break that hold, huh? Seems that way. Okay, so it's about more than just like policy changes. It's about who's actually running things inside the government, right? And to make sure things are moving in the right direction, they spent a lot of time talking about these three key White House policy councils. The National Security Council, the National Economic Council, and the Domestic Policy Council. Right, exactly. So what's the big deal about these councils? Well, think of them as the president's strategic advisors. They're coordinating policy across... I mean, this massive federal landscape. Trying to keep everything running smoothly. Yeah, making sure all the different parts are working together. They help set the president's legislative priorities and you know, make sure all the agencies are actually working towards those goals, which they imply wasn't always happening, even under Trump. Interesting. So to get a sense of those goals, the document gives us a peek at the Domestic Policy Council's top priorities, driving innovation, health care reform, strengthening border security. It's a pretty interesting mix, right? You've got economic competitiveness, and then also social order. Yeah. And speaking of security, mandate for leadership makes it pretty clear China is their top concern. Right. They want a massive increase in defense spending. They're saying we need to counter China's influence. It gets pretty specific too. modernizing and expanding the nuclear arsenal, bolstering the defense industrial base here at home, pushing allies to take on more responsibility. It's about more than just military, too. They talk a lot about the Buy American Act, how companies find loopholes to manufacture stuff overseas. They think that weakens our security, you know. It ties in with that whole economic nationalism theme, bringing jobs back to America. So it's like two birds with one stone. Something like that. OK, next hot topic. Immigration. Big changes here, too. Stricter vetting fully utilizing detention facilities, even prohibiting in-state tuition for undocumented immigrants. Big shift from what we've been seeing lately. Yeah, it's definitely a more, I guess you could say, law and order approach, right? Yeah. Big focus on border security, making it harder to enter illegally. They even want to limit alternatives to detention and parole. They see those as loopholes. So sending a clear message. Yeah. We welcome legal immigrants but no tolerance for breaking the rules. OK, and get this, they even want to downsize the Department of Education. They say most programs should be transferred to other agencies or just given to the states. That's a big shift, right? Huge. It shows their emphasis on federalism, local control. 
They think education should be handled closer to the people it affects. And it goes deeper than just shrinking the department. They want to change how education is funded, how it's delivered. They're all about school choice, things like education savings accounts, giving parents more power. It's a core part of their education agenda, mm -hmm. empowering parents, creating competition. It's not about you know, the bureaucracy calling all the shots. So a big shift in power dynamics is what they're after across the board. Yeah, less federal government, more power to states, communities, families. And speaking of power, they also argue for expanding presidential power. Oh, yeah, this is where it gets interesting. They want to bring back those executive orders that limit the power of the administrative state, yeah. you know? give the president more authority over agency guidelines, regulations, like a more powerful executive branch. They see a strong executive as key to pushing back against that bureaucracy, yeah. right? Which they see as entrenched, resistant to change. So it's about power within the government itself, too, not just between the government and the people. Exactly. But hey, it's not all smooth sailing, even within the conservative movement, right? Right. When it comes to economic policy, trade, and tariffs especially, they actually present two different viewpoints. Yeah. It's like they're acknowledging there's room for debate, you know? Not everything's black and white. We hear from two economists, Peter Navarro and Philip Lassman. Representing different schools of thought. Right. Navarro, you know, he's hawkish on China. He loves tariffs to protect American jobs. Lassman, he's more like tariffs hurt consumers, distort the market. He's for free trade. I kind of like that they show that internal debate, not just this monolithic conservative agenda. It makes it feel more, you know, real. Definitely. Add some nuance to it. OK, let's switch ears again. Intelligence community. Yeah. Big changes here, too, especially how we deal with China. They say we need to shift our focus, our resources, everything towards countering China. Yeah. And they want to avoid politicizing intelligence, making sure agencies provide objective assessments based on facts, yeah. not some political agenda. Exactly. So what else? Well, they want to reform the classification system because right now they think we're classifying too much information and it makes intelligence sharing harder. They want closer collaboration with allies, too, maybe even expanding arrangements like Five Eyes to counter China. OK, so it's not just about like being tough on China, but being smart about it, using our resources well. Exactly. Oh, and get this. They even talk about the Export Import Bank, the XMM. That one always gets people going. Right? Oh, yeah. Classic debate. Yeah. Free markets versus government intervention. And mandate for leadership lays it all out. Both sides. Both sides. The supporters say it helps American companies compete. You know, creates jobs. The critics say it just benefits big corporations, distorts the market. So they're letting the reader decide. Yeah, which I think is interesting. It shows they're you know willing to acknowledge those disagreements, even within the movement. They're not yeah. saying they're one right answer to everything. Well, this deep dive is definitely giving me a lot to think about. What's standing out to you so far? What are those moments where you're like, whoa, if a conservative president actually did this, things would get shaken up? For me, it's just a sheer scope of their vision. It's bold. They want to totally reshape how the federal government works. Like less government, more individual liberty, free markets, strong national defense. Mm. You may not agree with all of it, but you got to admire the ambition, you know, mm -hmm. challenging the status quo. That's what makes Mandate for Leadership so fascinating, right? It's like a window into the conservative movement. Their hopes, their worries, and their plan for, you know, where America goes next. And we're just getting started. There's so much more to unpack as we go deeper into this document. Exactly. So they're really going for a leaner government, mm. more strategically focused, right? Mm. Putting America first on the world stage, rolling back all that bureaucracy they keep talking about. OK, so let's get into the details. How do they actually plan to you know, pull all this off? Well, mandate for leadership gets really specific about departments and agencies. Starting with the Department of Defense, they talk about reforming the defense industrial base, streamlining acquisitions, even stuff like multi-year procurements. Like, they really get into the weeds. Yeah, it's all about making defense spending more efficient, more strategic. They want to make sure, you know, every dollar counts, maintaining that military edge. And a big part of that is prioritizing American companies, allied companies, when it comes to manufacturing. You know, not being too reliant on potential adversaries for all the important tech stuff. Right, that national security and economic strength connection again. And they also talk about the Defense Intelligence Enterprise, the DIE. Right, right. They want it to have a bigger role in, like, shaping national policy. It's about giving military intelligence more weight in those big decisions. Yeah, and they want the DIE to, you know, focus on its core mission. 
Cut out all the extra stuff. Make it more efficient. For example, they say moving security clearance investigations to a civilian agency. That was a mistake. Makes the civilians too reliant on the DOD. So streamline everything. Make it all about military readiness. Exactly. And speaking of readiness, the document also talks about the Navy, how it needs to adapt to all this new technology, right? Yeah, they said we got to find a balance. Investing in the traditional stuff, ships and all that, but also capitalizing on all the new stuff, drones, AI, all that. The future of warfare might look very different. They also want to expand the submarine force. Yeah. Big on that. Deterring adversaries like China, Russia. They even talk about developing offensive capabilities, you know, modernizing the whole submarine industrial base. It's like a constant race to stay ahead, right? Yeah, and they don't stop there. They get into the Space Force, too. Oh, yeah. They want to shake things up at the Space Development Agency, move away from that fail-early approach, focus on more rigorous engineering. Making sure those space systems are actually reliable, sustainable in the long run. Right, and they even talk about staffing more general officer positions in the Space Force. So they can compete for resources, you know? not get left behind. Makes sense. And of course, they talk about missile defense too. More funding for existing programs, new technologies, all that. They're big on being prepared. Yeah. And they say arms control is important, but only if it actually serves U.S. interests. If those efforts fail, well, got to be ready to compete, maintain that military advantage. So a strong military is non-negotiable, basically. Pretty much. Okay. Let's move on to Homeland Security big focus on border control here. They want to see a real shift in priorities at agencies like USCIS. Less about, you know, open borders, more about screening, vetting applicants. Right. Really cracking down. They want ICE to use all the detention space they've got, limit alternatives to detention, even use those blackies warrants for worksite enforcement. Which, just to clarify, are warrants used to arrest people who've been ordered deported but haven't left. So yeah, definitely a stricter approach. No messing around. They also talk about FEMA, how it's become, well, overstretched, trying to do too much, compensating for a lack of preparedness at the state and local level. It's that federalism idea again, right? Yeah. Empowering states to handle their own stuff. Exactly. They want FEMA focused on the really big disasters, catastrophic stuff. Let states and localities handle the smaller events. And they apply that same logic to the Coast Guard, scaling back their mission set. Focus on the core functions, right? Exactly. Make sure the resources are going where they're most needed. And when it comes to Homeland Security as a whole, better coordination, communication across all the different agencies, that's a big one. Right. Making sure everyone's on the same. even the Department of Education. It's not just a homeland security issue then. <laughs> right. It touches on all these different parts of government. And speaking of the State Department, Mandate for Leadership wants to make sure it's full of political appointees who agree with the president's foreign policy agenda. So no more career diplomats potentially pushing their own views, right? It's about making sure the State Department reflects the president's vision. They also want to reassess how the State Department deals with treaties international agreements. Which can be a real sticking point in foreign policy. Right. Mandate for leadership takes a very, I guess you could say, constitutionalist approach. They want to freeze any treaty negotiations that are happening, assess if they actually align with the president's goals, and even stop enforcing treaties that haven't been ratified by the Senate. That's a big statement, putting the Constitution first when it comes to foreign policy. And it signals a potential shift in how a conservative president would handle diplomacy less multilateralism, more national sovereignty. Exactly. And they want to give the Director of National Intelligence, the DNI, more power to run the intelligence community. Make it more centralized. Right. The DNI would be like the president's top advisor on all things intelligence. So streamline the whole intelligence community, cut down on bureaucracy, make sure it's providing actionable intel to the president. Exactly. And they keep hammering on this point about avoiding politicized intelligence. Making sure it's objective, fact-based. Right. They suggest encouraging intelligence leaders to stay neutral, you know, not get pressured by politicians to shape their analysis 
It's about rebuilding trust in the intelligence community. Okay. And they talk specifically about China, of course. More strategic intelligence sharing with allies, maybe even expanding those existing partnerships. Like the Five Eyes arrangement. Right. Working together to counter China. They also talk about overclassification. Too much information is classified, makes it harder to share intelligence, make good decisions. So reform the classification system, make it more transparent. Right. Finding that balance between protecting secrets and actually being able to, you know, govern effectively. Makes sense. And then they get into the CIA specifically. That oversees Voice of America Radio Free Europe. Oh, okay. What's the issue there? They think USAGM has become too focused on politics, you know, instead of promoting America's image abroad. Plus, there were those investigations that found security problems, potential vulnerabilities to foreign intelligence. Oh, wow. So they recommend fixing those vulnerabilities and then refocusing USAGM on providing unbiased news, promoting American values, not becoming a mouthpiece for any particular ideology. So back to basics, promoting a positive image of America. Exactly. And they apply that same thinking to USA. Foreign aid. Yeah, they want USA to promote free markets, a more business-friendly approach to development. They think it's gotten too focused on government solutions. They even criticize USAID's diversity, equity, and inclusion agenda. They see it as political, distracting from the core mission. So a conservative president would prioritize economic growth over, you know, social engineering when it comes to foreign aid. Right. And they want to reassess all those USAID programs in Latin America. They think a lot of them have failed and should just be shut down. It's about accountability, uh -oh. making sure the money is actually achieving something. Okay, makes sense. And then there's the Department of Agriculture, the USDA. Big one. What's their take? They say the USDA has gotten too focused on climate change, environmental stuff, and it's hurting agricultural production. Interesting. Yeah, they even criticize the USDA's vision statement, you know, the one about an equitable and climate smart food and agriculture economy. They're like, no, the USDA should be removing obstacles to food production, not trying to control the economy. So focus on the farmers, the ranchers, make sure America keeps producing food. Exactly. And they have all these specific reforms, hmm. addressing abuses within the Commodity Credit Corporation, reform and conservation programs, streamlining all those regulations about food safety, labeling. It's like a full on critique of the USDA saying it's lost its way. Okay, and then there's the Department of Education, and we already talked about how they want to downsize it. Right, big time. Shift most of the programs to other agencies, or to the states. Which is pretty controversial, I imagine. Oh, yeah. So why do they think that's necessary? They think the federal government has gotten way too involved in education. They say it's stifling innovation, forcing this one-size-fits-all approach that doesn't work. So back to local control, empowering parents, all that. Exactly. They want school choice, yeah. education savings accounts, letting parents use their tax dollars to choose the best schools for their kids. It's about competition, not just relying on the public school system. And they even recommend a new law, the Department of Education Reorganization Act, to make all these changes permanent. They're not meshing around. So less federal government, more power to states and families. That's the big theme here. And they're not afraid to use executive power to get it done. They want the president to issue executive orders. You know? Yeah. Reign in the administrative state, give him more control over all those agency guidelines and regulations. So really asserting the power of the executive branch. Yeah, pushing back against the bureaucracy. They even want to bring back some of those Trump era executive orders that Biden got rid of. Yeah. The ones about, you know, making guidance documents non-binding, preventing agencies from setting new rules for people outside the government. So shifting the balance of power within the government itself. Exactly. And this whole idea of reducing government intervention, promoting free markets, it extends to energy policy, too. Mandate for Leadership has a lot to say about the Department of Energy, all those commissions. Okay, what's the take there? They think the Department of Energy has gotten too obsessed with green energy climate change policies. At the expense of what? Well, they say it's hurting energy independence, making energy more expensive. Which is a pretty common critique from the conservative side. Right. They want to get rid of, or at least reform, all these offices within the Department of Energy. The ones that, in their view, 
are promoting certain types of energy that the government favors, like the Office of Clean Energy Demonstrations, the Office of State and Community Energy Programs, ARPAE. ARPAE, that's the one for advanced research projects. Right. And they say if those offices are going to exist, they should focus on basic science, energy security, not on you know, subsidizing particular energy sources. So let the market decide, basically. Exactly. And they get into some specific reforms for various offices, like the Office of Cybersecurity, Energy Security, and Emergency Response, or CSER. They want CSER to focus on the whole energy system, how everything's connected, natural gas, electricity, cybersecurity threats, all that. So a more holistic approach to energy security. Right. They also want to bring back a version of Trump's executive order on securing the power grid, the one Biden got rid of, making sure the grid can handle cyber attacks, physical attacks, all that. Keeping the lights on. Exactly. And then there's the Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy, EAR. They're not fans. Why not? They see it as a way to funnel taxpayer dollars into green energy subsidies, you know, pushing a decarbonization agenda. They want AIR to focus on energy security and making energy affordable, not climate change. Okay, so a pretty different set of priorities. Yeah, and they also want the Office of Science to go back to its original mission, basic science research, you know, <sighs> no political agenda. And they talk about the national labs making sure the economic benefits of all that research actually benefit the American people. So it's not just about the science itself, but how it's used, how it impacts the economy. Right, and then of course they talk about the National Nuclear Security Administration, the NNSA. The one that manages the nuclear weapon stockpile, right? Yeah, that's the one. <laughs> and then they say the top priority should be designing, developing, deploying new nuclear warheads. They think we don't have enough plutonium production, and we need to modernize our arsenal to keep up with China and Russia. So nuclear deterrence is still a big deal, even in the 21st century. Absolutely. They also want to reform the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, FERC, the one that regulates electricity transmission, natural gas, oil. They think FERC has been pushing renewable energy too much. With all these rules about transmission planning, cost allocation, they say it's going to hurt consumers. So another example of, you know, government overreach hurting the economy. Exactly. And they're not done yet. They move on to the Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA. Oh, boy, that's going to be interesting. They think the EPA has gotten way too big, too intrusive. All those regulations, they say, are killing economic growth without actually helping the environment that much. Classic conservative critique of the EPA. Yep. They want to cut the EPA's budget, streamline the regulations, make everything more transparent, improve the science. They even talk about specific changes to different offices within the EPA. Air and radiation, land and emergency management, research and development. It's like a whole blueprint for reforming the EPA. So less regulation, more focus on protecting human health and the environment, but in a way that doesn't stifle the economy. Exactly. And they move on to the Department of Health and Human Services, HHS, which is a huge department, obviously. So much going on there. Right. And mandate for leadership really emphasizes family values, traditional marriage, all that. They want HHS to prioritize policies that support those values. Okay, so how do they want to do that? Well, they talk a lot about promoting fatherhood, the importance of married fathers and raising kids. Which aligns with, you know, the broader social agenda of the conservative movement. Right. And they also talk about reforming the whole public health system. Because of COVID. Yeah. They say it lost the public's trust after the pandemic. Interesting. So what do they want to do? They want to restructure HHS so it can handle future public health emergencies better, more transparently, more scientifically, more flexibly. So they think the government's response to COVID was too heavy-handed, didn't respect individual liberties enough? That's the implication. Mm. They also talk about defining what actually constitutes a public health emergency. You know, clear criteria for when to declare an emergency, when to end it, make sure the government can't abuse its power. Okay, makes sense. What else? Well, they talk about the FDA, how they want to streamline the approval process for new drugs, medical devices. Get those treatments to patients faster. Speed things up, cut through the red tape. Right. And they want more transparency within the FDA, address mm -hmm. conflicts of interest, make sure decisions are based on science, not politics or pressure from the pharmaceutical industry. OK. And then there's Medicare and Medicaid, two of the biggest entitlement programs. Huge. And Mandate for Leadership says they're unsustainable as they are now. They need reform. Big time. Yeah. Give people more choices, they say. Okay. Move away from that one size fits all approach. Reform the financing. Give states more flexibility, more accountability. So empower individuals, reduce the role of the federal government. That's the recurring theme. 
They also have specific reforms for different HHS programs. Strength and work requirements for uh, TNF recipients, you know, the welfare program. So able-bodied adults should be working if they can. Right. Personal responsibility. They also want to reform sex education programs. More abstinence-based, more parental control over the curriculum. Okay, another example of their social agenda. What else? Well, they talk about the U.S. Public Health Service, the U.S. PHS. Give it a clearer role, streamline things, make sure the Surgeon General is actually accountable. And they want the Office of Refugee Resettlement to prioritize American citizens over refugees. Which is consistent with their views on immigration overall. Right. And they talk about reforming the Title X family planning program. They want to bring back the Trump administration's Protect Life rule, the one that prohibited Title X funds from going to abortion providers. So a very pro-life stance. Definitely. And they even want to roll back the Biden administration's changes to the Affordable Care Act, specifically Section 1557, the one that prohibits discrimination based on sexual orientation and gender identity in health care. Because they think it's too broad infringes on religious freedom. So another clash of values there. Right. And then they move on to housing policy, the Department of Housing and Urban Development, HUD. Big one. What's their take? They want to streamline HUD's programs, reduce regulations, and generally take a more market-oriented approach to housing. Less government subsidies, more private sector solutions. Okay, so less government involvement overall. Right. They also want to reform the Community Development Block grant program. They think it's become too bureaucratic. They want a more flexible system, give states and localities more control over the money. Empowering local communities to address their own housing needs. Exactly. And they want to get rid of the Biden administration's policies on property appraisal and valuation equity. They say those policies could undermine the whole appraisal system. So another critique of the Biden administration's efforts to address racial disparities. Right. And they also want to cut all climate change spending from HUD's budget. Not surprising, given what we've seen in other departments. Right. Consistent theme. They also go into detail about specific HUD programs, fair housing, homelessness assistance, community development, all that. So a pretty thorough overhaul of HUD. Yeah, definitely. And then there's the Department of the Interior, DOI, another big one, managing all those natural resources. So what's their take on DOI? Well, they think DOI is important, but it's become too bureaucratic, too focused on environmental protection, and it's hurting economic development. There's that balance again. Right. They want to streamline regulations, increase transparency, and give states and local communities more power to manage their own resources. They also talk about specific changes to the Bureau of Land Management, the National Park Service, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. So less red tape, more responsible resource development, more local control. Exactly. They also criticize the Biden administration's decision to move the Bureau of Land Management headquarters back to Washington, D.C. After Trump moved it to Colorado, right? Right. They think it makes DOI less effective, takes those decision makers away from the communities they're supposed to be serving. So keep the government close to the people. Exactly. Yeah. They also want to reverse Biden's policies on oil and gas leasing on federal lands. They think those policies are hurting energy development hurting the economy. So more energy independence, less environmental regulation. That's the gist of it. And they talk about specific reforms to various DOI programs, endangered species, national parks, tribal relations, all that. So a pretty comprehensive agenda for DOI. Yeah, definitely. And then there's the Department of Justice, BOJ. Mandate for leadership says we need to restore the DOJ's credibility, make sure it's upholding the rule of law fairly, impartially. Which is something both sides tend to accuse each other of, right? politicizing the justice system. Yeah, it's a common complaint. But Mandate for Leadership thinks the DOJ has gotten especially bad under Biden. Too many politically motivated prosecutions, not enough focus on things like violent crime, immigration enforcement. Trees are too intrusive, undermine local control of law enforcement. They want a more collaborative approach to police reform, working with local agencies, not dictating from Washington. So respect for federalism, local control, all that. Exactly. They also want to reform the DOJ's Civil Rights Division. They think it's become too focused on diversity, equity, inclusion, 
not enough on individual rights. Interesting. Yeah, they specifically criticized the DOJ's focus on disparate impact claims. Which are claims where a policy or practice might not be intentionally discriminatory, but it has a disproportionate impact on a certain group. Right. And they think those claims are often based on bad statistics lead to reverse discrimination. So they want to focus on equal opportunity, not equal outcomes. Exactly. They also want to reform the DOJ's Office of Justice programs, OJP, the one that gives out grants. Mm -hmm. They think OJP has too much power to decide who gets grants, and they think that power is often used to push a liberal agenda. So they want more transparency, more accountability in the grant-making process. Right. And less power for OJP staff to add conditions to grants, which they think are often used to impose a liberal agenda on the grant recipient. So no more social engineering through grants. Right. And they want the DOJ to get serious about immigration enforcement, which they think the Biden administration has neglected. So more prosecutions, more collaboration with DHS, a tougher stance overall. Exactly. And then they move on to the Department of Labor. OK, what's the take there? They think the Department of Labor is too focused on protecting unions, protecting workers at the expense of businesses, at the expense of economic growth. So a very pro-business stance. Definitely. They want to reduce regulations, promote worker freedom, make sure the Department of Labor is focused on growing the economy, creating jobs. Okay, so what are some of the specifics? Well, they criticize the Biden administration's efforts to expand the definition of a joint employer. They say it'll hurt small businesses, franchisees. So make it harder for businesses to operate. Right. They want a narrower definition, protect businesses from being held liable for things their contractors or franchisees do. Okay, so less liability for businesses. Exactly. And they also want to make it easier for businesses to classify workers as independent contractors, not employees. They say it gives workers more flexibility, lets businesses operate more efficiently. So less regulation, more freedom. Right. And they want to reform the National Labor Relations Board, the NLRB. They think it's biased in favor of unions. So appoint new members who are more sympathetic to businesses, make sure the NLRB is being fair, impartial. Exactly. And they also target OSHA, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration. They think it's too much of a burden on businesses. So reduce the regulations, focus on the really serious safety hazards, not the minor stuff. Right. Common sense regulations. And they also want to reform how retirement savings are regulated. More individual choice, less government mandates. Okay, so what does that look like? Well, they criticize the use of ESG factors in investment decisions. ESG, that's environmental, social, and governance factors, right? Right. And they see it as a way for liberal activists to push their agenda through the financial system. So keep politics out of investing? Exactly. And they also want to reform trade policy to protect American workers and businesses. Stronger trade agreements, crack down on foreign labor violations, get tough on China, all that. It's like a more protectionist approach to trade. Yeah, putting American interests first. Yeah. And then there's transportation policy. Mandate for Leadership argues that the Department of Transportation has become too focused on mass transit, other alternatives, at the expense of highways and roads. Interesting. Yeah, they want more investment in highways and roads. They say they'll reduce congestion, boost the economy, and they want to streamline the environmental review process for transportation projects, which they think takes way too long. So less red tape, more infrastructure. Exactly. They also have some ideas for reforming the FAA, the Federal Aviation Administration. Okay, what are those? They think the FAA has become too bureaucratic, too afraid of taking risks, and it's stifling innovation in the aviation industry. So what's the solution? They want to give the FAA more independence, maybe even separate it from the Department of Transportation. And they want to reform the FAA's funding system, make it less reliant on those annual appropriations from Congress. So give them more stability, more long-term planning ability. Right. And then there's the Department of Veterans Affairs, the VA. Which has had its problems, obviously. Yeah. And Mandate for Leadership wants to make sure the VA is actually serving veterans well. Okay. So what do they propose? They want to expand veterans' access to private sector health care, streamline the disability claims process, and hold VA employees accountable for doing their jobs. So improve the quality of care, make the VA more efficient, more responsive to veterans' needs. Exactly. And Mandate for Leadership also offers some broader recommendations for economic policy as a whole. Okay, what are those? They want a pro-growth agenda, tax cuts, deregulation, sound monetary policy, you know, classic conservative stuff. Stimulate the economy, create jobs. Right. And they also want to reform the Federal Reserve. The Fed. 
Yeah, they think it's become too powerful, too willing to meddle in the economy. They want to limit the Fed's ability. to be, you know, independent, democratic. Okay, so what else? Well, they also talk about the Small Business Administration, the SBA. The one that helps small businesses get loans and stuff. Right, and they think the SBA has become too bureaucratic, too prone to mission creep. Doing too much, basically. Exactly. They want to streamline the SBA's programs, get rid of the ones that don't work, focus on helping truly small businesses, not bigger companies that don't really need government help. So make the SBA more efficient, more effective. Right. And they also talk about reforming trade policy to help small businesses, reducing tariffs and other barriers. So on trade, there's some diversity of opinion within the conservative movement, right? Some want more protectionism, some want free trade. Exactly. And mandate for leadership doesn't really take sides in that debate. They just offer some ideas for how trade policy can better support small businesses. Okay, so it's not just about economics, national security, all that. They also talk about government reform in general how to make the whole system more accountable. Right, they want to strengthen oversight, streamline regulations, empower frontline workers, make government more focused on results, not just process. So a more efficient, more effective government serving the needs of the people. That's the goal. Well, this deep dive has been pretty intense so far. So much to unpack. What's standing out to you as we go deeper into mandate for leadership? What are those aha moments where you're like, wow, this could really change things. For me, it's the sheer scope of their vision. Yes. It's bold. They want to totally reshape how the federal government works. Yeah. Like less government, more individual liberty, free markets, strong national defense. Yeah. You may not agree with all of it, but you got to admire the ambition, mm -hmm. you know, challenging the status quo. It's a roadmap for a pretty different America, that's for sure. Definitely. And we're just getting started. There's so much more to unpack as we go deeper into this document. Exactly. So it's about more than just, you know, shrinking the government. They want to change how it actually works, how decisions are made, all that. Right. It's like they're saying the administrative state has gotten too big for its britches. That's yeah. kind of how they see it. And they want to pull it back, give more power back to, well, the elected officials, right? Exactly. They want to restore that balance of power, like you said. Okay. So one of their big ideas is to give more power to political appointees, right? The folks the president appoints to run these different parts of the government. Right. They think presidents should be able to appoint people who, you know, actually agree with them, who are on board with their agenda and who will get things done. Makes sense. It's their administration after all. But they also talk about changing how people get hired in the government, right? Making it easier to find people who are, well, on the same page as the president. Right. Making the bureaucracy more responsive to, I guess you could say, the will of the people since they elected the president. So it's not just about who's in charge, but how the whole system works. They also talk about all that bureaucratic red tape, how to make things more efficient. Yeah, they want fewer regulations, a simpler rulemaking process, more transparency, more accountability. And more power for those frontline workers, the people who actually deal with the public day to day. Right, let them make decisions instead of everything having to go up the chain of command. So a more flexible, more responsive government, basically. And of course, they're big on fiscal responsibility, too, right? Cutting spending, balancing the budget, all that. Oh, yeah. They see the national debt as a huge problem. Yeah. And they say, we need to get serious about reducing spending, reforming entitlements, cutting wasteful programs, making government more efficient. So it's a really big vision, touching on pretty much every aspect of government. It's ambitious, that's for sure. Definitely. And whether you agree with them or not, it's a serious attempt to lay out, like you said, a conservative vision for what government should be. Right. What its role is in society. It's a document that deserves to be read, to be debated, you know? Absolutely. It makes you think about the big questions, you know? The balance of power, how much power the government should have, the limits of government intervention in the economy. It's all in there. And it reminds us that this debate, it's never really over. There's no easy answer to, like, what's the perfect role of government, right? right. It's a constant conversation, a constant evolution. So as you keep reading Mandate for Leadership, and we hope you do, think about what it would actually mean to put these ideas into practice. What are the trade-offs, the potential consequences, both good and bad? Because these are big ideas, and they could have a big impact on all of our lives. Definitely. 
So as we wrap up this deep dive, what's the key takeaway for our listeners? I think the most important thing is to remember that Mandate for Leadership isn't just about policy. It's about values, about a vision for America. It's about limited government, individual liberty, free markets, a strong national defense. And even if you don't agree with everything they say, these are issues that affect everyone, right? Absolutely. And it's a reminder that we all need to be engaged to think critically about the role of government to participate in shaping our country's future. Because in the end, it's our country, right? It is. So keep diving deep. Keep those critical thinking caps on. We'll see you next time. See you next time.